Okay, turning it around. Okay, hey guys, this is Facebook land and I did magic. Look who I brought from New York, Troy. <laughs> Troy Allen is here, oh my God. Troy, you're from New York. I don't think anything, well, what? Originally from Colorado, but now in New York, New York. Wow. Yeah. Nothing funny in New York. No, it's all humorous if you look hard enough, but no, it's not funny at all. No. Yeah. It's a mess. What do you have to say to people to encourage them right now in this economic, in this whole crap fest we're in? It, it's real. Take the precautions. You don't have to panic. Precautions are smart. Panic is stupid. And it's, it's not you you're fighting for when you wear a mask. It's the person who's going to die because of this stuff, because they're weakened, they're elderly. Who knows what's going on? Just be smart. Fight, fight a battle for someone you don't know. Wow. And I don't have, I don't have to express that to most people. Yes. Just, you know, the mask-wearing, assault rifle-carrying morons that are storming places right now to protest policies that their president put in place. Yeah, you don't want to get me started on this. This will just turn into a hate rally for <laughs> Did you shave your head just for the interview? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think I think very importantly during this the shutdown, letting go of like your normal daily habits is the path to madness. Yeah, because um, it's easy to go from Smeagol to Gollum really quick in this context. You know, you enter. I'm a normal human. Three days later, ah, we're gonna eat people. <laughs> um, so I try to you know keep my workout routine as much as I can, like yoga, whatever I can do in the house. Shower, shave my head, keep my face, you know, so I don't look like I've lost a job because I did. I lost three in one day, like a lot of people in America. Yes. And, uh, I think if you let go of those habits and let your life devolve in these, in this we're sort of, we're sort of in a, an eddy in the world. We just kind of stopped and we're just not really going anywhere. We're just circulating. And uh, when this is over, if you let it all go, well, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time adjusting back. Yes. You know, like I gave up once in my life. Life was too difficult when I got hit by a drunk driver and I had brain trauma, right? And oy, my daughter was taking care of me and I gave up on life. I just get, and boy, was it hard to get back in the rat race. I, I will, and you had the added complication of having to rehabilitate yourself, learn some things over again and, and rewire it and just power up the brain again. Uh, yeah, so, you know, if it was difficult that way, imagine, you know, it's going to be less difficult, but I think people, if I see, I see a lot of my friends, not a lot of my friends, but some of them are just going, yeah, I've, I've worn pets, sweatpants for a month and I haven't shaved. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, good luck with those Zoom shows. <laughs> <laughs> looking like Tom Hanks from Castaway. <laughs> Holy hell. <laughs> finding out just how fast we can get weird but try to keep it at bay you know? i know because otherwise life is just a pandora's box of chocolates oh, i love a pandora's box of chocolates <laughs> you me? that sounds delicious give me your address i'll send you some chocolates <laughs> well I'm, I'm a part of what i've been doing in the pandemic to keep busy is i started uh, making and selling pot cookies <laughs> Ooh. I love it. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I, I just got an order for some more. They're really simple, no-baked chocolate peanut butter oatmeal cookies with a low dose of weed in them. And, nice. And, you know, I, I do the weed process really well so you can't taste it. And they're, they're delicious and they give you just enough of a high to kind of, <sighs> I don't have to worry about this. I can just go to sleep and wake up tomorrow and it'll be a better day. Do the pot cookies have the effect that they make you remember when the word Trump was just a verb? Because I need that pot. God, wouldn't it? No, that's not pot. That's a lobotomy. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> these, these will make it so that you don't feel the pain. Not that it's not pain. <laughs> yeah, but these aren't the kind of cookies that, you know, you, you take one and you, you look like, uh, you know, Jeez, oh, what's his name? Jim Brewer. <laughs> <laughs> he always looks like he's totally baked. I love him. He's hilarious. But, you know, you don't eat one in it. You just eat it and you kind of relax. My roommate's my quality assurance guy. I just <laughs> give him a little bit and he goes, yeah, we're working. I keep 
off to bed. It's hilarious. <laughs> you know what's funny? I ordered a tripod to hold the camera, and I don't know why I thought I could hold on to a camera and interview comedians, because <laughs> that's not working. I'm shaking. Uh, it's just, be just too much at one time, yeah. I know, I'm doing... I just got the tripod set up for the show tonight. I'm going to do that with my phone on Instagram. We'll see. I don't know. Your show tonight is 9 o'clock Eastern? Uh, no, it's, uh, let me see, I believe it's, it's uh, 10 o'clock Eastern on Instagram at Socially Distant Improv. I love it. You guys get on there and listen to this guy. Look how funny he is all by himself. <laughs> Go listen to me. Tell jokes about the virus. <laughs> you know, we're all, I think we're probably already going to be sick of virus jokes by the time we can tell virus jokes to people who haven't heard them yet. Maybe your virus jokes will go viral. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> we, every comic looking at the virus spread is like, well, yeah, that looks good. I'm just, that's, that's good work right there. I want to do it with the corona. I want to get it to that many countries and that many people. We're a petty crew. <laughs> okay, so this whole thing has hit New York really hard. So I want to get, I want to get serious. How many of you have have you lost track of how many people are sick and dying that you know? Because I have, and I'm not there. No, I haven't. Um, it's I haven't. Of course, I haven't been keeping track. But a few of my friends have had it, and I've watched their journeys. One of my friends has it right now. Jen, a very funny comic, Jenny Wareham. She's a. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce her last name. How do you spell it? She's just she's on the mend from it. A guy named Kirk Smith, who's also a guy from California, uh, he's on the mend. Luke Monas had it. He's on the mend. Craig Mahoney has it. Um, you know, I've lost three friends from completely unrelated things in the comedy world since March 18th. It's just it, it's 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 a spring of just horrendousness. Um, yes. So you gotta, Luckily, none of my friends, I know that there's a comic in the community I did not know well uh, who passed from the virus, a relatively young man. Uh, but outside of that, that's, you know, most of my experience is lots of people dying that I don't know. A few people close to me have had it, and they seem to be recovering. Good. I know at my level in comedy, you know, Bruce Lipsky over at Comic Strip Live, a regular in Gladys's room, he... He narrowly got to the edge, and he's trying to make a comeback. Okay, yeah. There was a guy at Gotham, uh, James Carnazio, who uh, he's part of their security and management team. He had it, and it was pretty severe. Um, but he's out of the hospital, and I was holding my breath for him because it was looking not great. Do you know Jeffrey Gurian? Yes. He writes for the Intero Bank. He had it, and uh, it was pretty bad for him. But last I saw, he was on the mend and coming back around. I hope I haven't checked. I hope that's still true. You know, what was really sad for me was Chario over at Dangerfields. Yeah, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't get up there, but um, I have. I just you know, spent a lot of time going to Dangerfields. Yeah. But when I was there, you see Chario, and he was <laughs> he was his own thing, and God rest his soul, because I mean, every time. He went up, he smashed in that room. It was ridiculous. Really? Yeah, they put him up and he would just crush. There was this, the, the audience was just on his side constantly. Every time I saw it, I was amazed. And, you know, he wrote solid jokes for what his style of comedy, which was, you know, the style of comedy that was popular when Dangerfields was new. <laughs> yes. But God bless him. He kept it. He, he did that with his whole life. And I call that a good life. He was doing the things he cared about in a place you belong. I, I, don't, I don't know how it gets better. It's easy to judge someone like that. Yes. I, I, think we should, I think we should admire them more than judge them. Yes. There was a guy over at Comic Strip Live that was a regular there for decades that passed away. A short guy, maybe in his 50s, with his name ended in a Y. I don't know. Kate Meany um, told Kevin me. Meany? Kevin Meany's daughter posted about a guy at Comic Strip Live when she was pouring drinks at Comic Strip, he was a comic there. Anyway, he passed away. It's on her page. I can't remember his name. But everybody, Comic Strip's sad. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see that one. I didn't know. Yeah. It's hard. You know, like, I'm not making fun of the Holocaust, but 
My dad went through it, and at least they didn't have to put up with Facebook posts about everybody passing away. <laughs> you know, like, in some ways... There's no way that you would have been able to keep up with them. Yeah, Facebook would have crashed if we were posting that kind of thing. Yes. It's awful. Yeah. I you know, can't imagine, you know, but I, I guess the funny part, if, if there is a Holocaust survivor in New York, they're just like, what else? What's <laughs> used to this? <laughs> This, this is a cakewalk. I can do this. Don't send me back here. <laughs> well, you, what kind of... In the Holocaust, there it is. That was funny. What do you have that you would like to encourage people with? Because this isn't a very encouraging time. I mean, can we be real? No, it, it isn't. But, you know, everything that's bullshit in our lives, all of it... I, think maybe I'm experiencing this maybe other people are this this shutdown the isolation has stripped the bullshit away a lot of the bullshit of our day that we didn't like anyway um so why not everything that you want to do now and you have time to do because these are the things that let me back up the things that we want to do we don't have time for with all the bullshit the day job and all that you got it now so focus on those things because that's what you should be doing with your time anyway. This just clears away the bullshit and gives you absolutely 100% chance to focus on the things that you want to give priority in your life and then see maybe what comes on the other end. Because My life wasn't bad before then, uh, but I don't want it to be the exact same when I come out of this. I want to maybe be a, a slightly changed person for the better, um, want to still be in good shape, want to still be doing comedy. But I just want to come out of this a slightly better person with a little more enriched life in whatever way I can in this isolation and take advantage of it. If you were to be able to um, come out a better person today, not in another month to, to gather it together, but today, how do you see that you have already become a better person? Well, I can't point to any accomplishments of having been better. I'm just... <laughs> Just trying to get there, um, you know. For me, if you talk to anybody that knows me, they're gonna be like, "Yeah, that guy's pissed off a lot. He's angry." So I've been taking this time to focus on that part of who I am, or that part of me that I've cultivated as part of an image. You know, oh, that's the angry guy, and I'm the six foot three, bald German Irish angry dude. Like, ah, he's terrifying. It's gonna, and well, and it's never terrifying. It's isolating, and it's you know, it's completely counterproductive so i want to you know just get rid of that deal with that a little more effectively and have some tools to not you know fly off the handle and do some of the things that have gotten me interrogated by federal agents in washington square park i want to talk about that <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a, it's a story i'm going to try to tell on the risk podcast at some point what's the risk what's the risk podcast uh, it's, a, it's a storytelling podcast, um, and they, they get into all manner of things. The guy that runs it is a guy named Kevin Ellison, and uh, it's it's world it's world famous. And he's got a huge following, and he tells these stories. And he's he's really into some uh, some 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 interesting sexual things that he's told stories about, and it, it gets it it runs the spectrum. You know, that's not the story, that's not the show where you show up and you're like, all right, well, I had a great day, I picked some flowers, somebody <laughs> hugged me, and I made money. No, nobody, it's a fucking boring story right there. A good day is always a boring story, so these are just great stories of just, whoa, yikes. Can his um, stories put hair on Madonna's chest from 1989? <laughs> they might, yeah. You know, some of that stuff challenges my limitations as a human being when I hear, oh, wow. <laughs> All right, that's that's how other people do it. <laughs> but you also you hear some touching things, you hear some insightful things from people. They because you know you've been through your experience with the brain injury. I've got my own demons, and, and everybody has them. And it's how they deal with them and learn to dance with them that I want to learn about. Because you know, I spent my whole time, my whole life trying to fight shit, and you know that's just, mm, that doesn't work. You got you can't you can't fight the demons. You got to learn to dance with them. I love that. I would like to find a guy that wants to marry me who also, who also is very angry at people that are mean to me. You know, I'm getting tired of fighting uh, my, for myself. I, I want a guy that's really, 
really lets it out. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want that. Believe me when I tell you, you do not want that. Ask my ex-girlfriends, you do not want that. <laughs> um, because I, uh, I'm easily incited to aggression, especially when I'm around with somebody I care about. And it, it doesn't, it's not as fun as it sounds. Somebody to protect you and step in, yes, but somebody that wants to burn the world down sometimes, like I'm inclined to do, just, or just completely destroy anybody who hurts something I care about. And that, that's, it, it sounds good, but it doesn't work out to be a very healthy relationship. Got it. What's the thing in your comedy career that you, Troy Allen, are the most proud of? Forget your family and fans and friends and haters. You. What are you most proud of? Um, you know, I think probably the one-man show from last year. <gasps> I forgot the introduction. I'm so sorry. It doesn't matter. Um, I, did, uh, I did a show called Funny Stories About Pain at the Fringe Festival last year. I didn't do the whole month. I did nine nights. Um, and, uh, in, in many ways it was a challenge to myself. Can I just do this, follow through and make this happen? Cause I've got great ideas. Lots of us have great ideas, but I got <laughs> shitty follow through and, and this, this forced it. And I did an hour on stage every night telling stories about the worst things that have happened in my life and trying to make them funny to complete strangers. And that was, it was fun. The last night was the wow. best performance. With the best crowd, I left on a high note because it it's a struggle to get crowd over there if you're a nobody like me. You know, I don't have management or Live Nation isn't behind me promoting stuff. So I had to do it myself. And whew, that, was, that was the brutal part of the French. If you're thinking about it, promotion, getting people into your show is the hardest part. Writing a show, we can do that. Getting people in it, oh, brutal. I want to ask you, I mean, I've got so much... Uh, drama and trauma, you know, like you're, when your parents are Holocaust survivors, you're born into drama. You're just like a magnet for it. And so I want to know uh, tips. I'll pay you to give me tips on how to make my baggage funny <laughs> instead of depressing people. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a learn. How long have you been in comedy? How long have you been in comedy? I've been writing for 10 years. And on stage for six, and I, out of six years, I've fallen off three stages. <laughs> you fallen off three stages? That left over from the brain injury? Uh huh. It was the first I week. I, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but that is pretty funny. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. I guess the first tip is to stay on stage. <laughs> if I could give anybody good advice, is remain on the stage that's going to be the first step um then i i don't know i got uh when when i tell these stories i first and chris titus does this um because he's a great storyteller he'll write the story out without jokes just the facts the the chronology of events um as a narrative and then he goes back and he underlines i think he says he underlines a fact in each in each part of it and then he writes a joke about that particular fact uh, which isn't a, a procedural way to go about it. Um, I, I believe that wherever there's suffering, there's an opportunity for humor because suffering is oftentimes absurd. And the height of absurdity was the Holocaust. That it happened, that it happened in broad daylight with the consent of an entire country, not the entire country, but with the complicity of an entire country, for, for better or for worse. Maybe it's... Maybe, that's not fair. I'm German. Yes. I mean, I can say my grandparents were Holocaust survivors too, but that's not as surprising because we're German Christians. Of course, my grandparents survived it. But when when I look at even the things in my own life, there's always an opportunity for humor if there's absurdity. You can tease that absurdity out. Um, what's a good example? This this is kind of a lighthearted dark joke but, and I won't tell the joke but my uh, the family dog died a couple of years ago and when I went back home I didn't go back home just to pay respects but I went back home I wanted to pay respects because you Dee Dee was uh, part of my life since I was 16 years old and she died I think when I was 44 45 and uh, I went back to pay respects and I found out when she was buried that it was my stepdad who buried her and he put her in a Tupperware container <laughs> and buried her in in the backyard at the base of a tree 
<laughs> yeah, it's an unceremonious death for the family pet, an unceremonious burial. But I, uh, when I heard that, I was like, God, really, Tom? And then my next thought was, you don't get any say in the burial plans we make for my mom. You don't, you don't get to participate in that because of how badly you handled this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Like I say that my parents uh, survived the Holocaust and, you know, I suffer so much because of it with hangnails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, that's, that's a good joke because it, it suggests, it, it, it incorporates, hey, I've got anxiety left over from this. My parents made me a little neurotic and I don't trust Germans. I won't drive a BMW ever. I've, I've known people like that. I used, when I was a personal trainer, I trained this Jewish couple. And, uh, <laughs> That's and funny they, right there. <laughs> Simon just would not buy a German-made vehicle. He was like, yeah, I, I, I like them, but nah. Because, <laughs> no, just they participated in this in some way. They, 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 they manufactured tanks. And he's like, no, I'm not going to support this organization. I'm like, okay, I, I can get that. I, I feel the same way about the Catholic Church. I'd like to watch it burn to the ground, except for the art that's in there, because we want to preserve that, but, you know. What were you doing when Notre Dame was on fire? Uh, I'm making fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought is somebody, somebody said, oh, well, I shouldn't have put so much hellfire, more brimstone next time, less hellfire. <laughs> I, uh, I was in Paris a couple of years ago, and I'm glad I got to see uh, Notre Dame before before that tragedy. Because that is, whatever I think of the church, that isn't the church. That is that is man. That is that is craftsmanship, architecture, art, history, and culture that was burning down. Yeah, I'd like to see the institution of the church destroyed, but I was sad for that. I didn't go into Notre Dame, which I regret. I met a bicycle tour right outside of it. That, that to me was a pretty big tragedy. Did you do the Tour de France? Did I? Yeah. No, no, no I would never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, well, I do teach cycling. I'm an indoor spin cycling instructor. What? Yeah. That's so cool. Let me, let me correct that. I was an indoor cycling instructor. I was a comedian. I also did used to teach a CPR. Those were what I used to do. Who knows what the hell tomorrow is going to be. So did you get to tell jokes and revive people in your spin classes? No, nah, it's hard to tell jokes when people are sweating and trying to keep up with me. <laughs> I like to say I keep up with me, but I, uh, oh man. For a while I had this uh, kid in my class, he was great, he was in his 20s, maybe 24, but he was a former like 3A division baseball player. Wow. On top of that. So he was in great shape, but he hated his job. So he would come to he would come to class ready to just go balls out a hundred percent. I have no business trying to keep up with a kid half my age. But when I saw him pedaling, I you know, I try to set the pace for the class and, and make it a good example and they can work at their own pace, that's the way it should be. But I would key I just have him in that consciousness just oh, can't keep up with the twenty four year old guy. I come out of those classes just annihilated, like good. God, man, this, my ego is going to run me into a heart attack. <laughs> oh. So, 
he was great to have, but yeah. So let's say they let us out of our rooms today, because right now we're really bad teenagers and we're left, at least we're left to our own devices. We didn't have devices in my day. And no. you, yeah. And so we get out of our room today. What's the first thing you're going to do? They just. You know, because I, I've made pretty good hay about what we're doing here. You know, I, I still ride my bike to deliver the pot cookies I'm selling. I just got an order for 18 of them just while we we're sitting here on my phone. Um, so I haven't been inside as much as some other people. I've, you know, spent four five, six hours out of the house on my bike for exercise. I, I don't know what the first thing I do is. I think the first thing I want to do is give someone a big ass hug. That's what I want. That's what I'm missing in my life is totally, you know, and it doesn't have, you know, it's not a sexual thing. It's, I don't care who it is. Somebody that I see, like, I just want to hug them and hold on to them and be like, Oh, because I, I miss that dynamic. I miss my friends being able to, you know, if I'm in a bad mood, touch me and that breaks it. I'm very tactile that way. Yes. If I go too long without it, I get weird. <laughs> well, this interview has almost come to an end and I leave it to a woman to know. I'm not going to fake it, you know, like some women do. But the thing is, is that... Um, you know, um, pot brownies is something that everybody around the country would love to have. Either the recipe for it or have you order, you know, send it to them. How do they do that? Can it go across state lines? Well, it's a felony uh, to send edibles across state lines, but I've sent to Baltimore and also Connecticut. Wow. Uh, yeah, they have to pay for shipping, and I would, you know, vacuum pack the cookies so they're because they're they're no bake. They're chocolate, peanut butter, oatmeal, cream, sugar, and shortening. That's it. And uh, and good. then I infuse the weed into the shortening so you don't taste it or smell it. And it's a very mild high. So yeah, if they want to reach out to me, I, you know, don't I don't reach out to me because that's going to be a cop, and then I'll go to jail. <laughs> if you know <laughs> Troy. If he, if Troy has already vetted you, then reach out to him. Yeah, yeah. You could, you know, if you know someone, uh, send them to me or you order them, I'll send them to you. That's right. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for your time, Troy Allen. And I, I just pray that New York heals as good as they can. It's no joke what's going on in New York. I'll tell you that. Same in California. Yes, in California. Okay. What? Keep safe out there. You too. Let's try to stay sane as best comics can. <laughs> it's too late for us, but maybe we can help other people. Yes. Thank you, Troy Allen. And he was on the Scarborough, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Comedy Edinburgh. Fest. Yeah. What? Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Thank you, God. Me in details. Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I'm always on the fringe. He was in the fringe festival and he did a one man play, one man show. Yep. Got, got great audience reviews. The critic review was, but I didn't disagree with anything they said. That's the beauty of it. Well, then you're smart. Yeah, it was an honest review and I got, he, he gave me credit for where I deserved it. He dinged me where I deserved it. I'm not going to ever complain about it. Where does somebody get a hold of your one-man show that was on, huh? I, I, I didn't publish it. Um, oh. the, last ep the last performance was good, uh, but the, my camera had somebody kind of sitting in front of it. They'd lean over. It is, so I just, you know, I'll keep working on the stories. I think I'm probably going to start a podcast called Funny Stories About Pain, and I'll tell some of these stories. I'm going to be listening. I'll be looking for that. Be sure, will you tag me when that comes out, please? Yeah, that's got to be one of the things I maybe do here. I'm going to call it that, or maybe Troy's Stories, or Troy Stories, because of play on Toy Stories. We'll see. Very good. Thank you so much again for your time. Hugs. Okay, bye. You too, bye. Love you. Love you. <laughs> bye. Wasn't that cool? Good old Troy.
Alan taking time out of his day to give us tips and funny stuff. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Troy Allen. Oh my gosh. Okay, so hit me up, you guys. I want to interview you. If you're a comic, even if you're not funny yet, who cares? If you're a comic, if you're a booker, if you're a club owner, if you're an artist, and even once in a while a doctor and a nurse, you know? We're not the only heroes out there, it turns out. Okay, thanks guys, bye.